going on, Rock? Everyone doing well? It's the summertime. Good times, good times. Well, man, I'm just glad to be here with you guys and glad to share the word with you this morning. Let me jump right in. So in the year 2000, uh, there was this movie that was released that became an instant classic. Uh, registering at almost $500 million in box office sales uh, and eventually winning multiple Academy Awards, multiple uh, Golden Globe Awards amongst dozens and dozens of other honors. Uh, this film, set in the time of the Roman Empire, tells the story of a once powerful general who was forced to become a slave. Now, the emperor's son, Commodus, is enraged when he is passed over as heir in favor of his father's favorite general. And so he, what does he do? He kills his father. Um, he, um, he, he also murders the general's family, and the general is sold into slavery to be trained as a gladiator. Now, ultimately, this general who became a slave, who became a, a gladiator, grows in such popularity and favor in the arena and beyond that he threatens the most powerful position in all of Rome, the new emperor, Commodus himself. And so Maximus would eventually give his life to save the nation. Now, if that's a spoiler to you, it's on you because it's like 20 years old. <laughs> 20 years old. All right. Was that a good little quick breakdown for those of you who say, did I do okay? I do all right. All right. So we're at the end of a short series that we've been calling Spirit Led, and our desire has been to communicate what Paul so beautifully articulated in Romans 8.14, where he says that all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, right? So being led by the Spirit, living a life of surrender and obedience to God, to say it another way, uh, is a surefire way to know whether or not you are a child of God and it's a way to identify the sons and daughters of God around you. And so it's fitting that Paul is the one who makes the statement because I believe he is uh, one of the greatest examples in all of scripture of what living a spirit-led life looks like practically. All right, he is. And so where do we meet Paul? We meet Paul uh, in the book of Acts, uh, early in the book. We see Jesus promising that he would send the Holy Spirit as a representative of his personal uh, presence to empower his followers to go out into the world and bear witness to the good news of his kingdom. And so in Acts chapter 2, as we know, the Holy Spirit came and in doing so, began to, began to cause conflict with religious leaders and led to the persecution of Christians. Now, that wasn't all bad. Because as Christians were forced to leave Jerusalem, as they were forced to scatter, as the Christians scattered, so did the gospel message. And Paul was one of those people who sought to persecute Christians until Jesus encountered him in Acts chapter 9 while he's on his way to Damascus. Uh, Paul was on his high horse and he was heading over to per persecute more Christians. And Jesus knocks him off his high horse strikes him blind, and then sends him into the city to a man named Ananias to pray for him so that he would get his sight back and so that he would receive the Holy Spirit. Well, then the Jesus, uh, Jesus's message and his movement, uh, it, it started to move out and communities began to, to go outside of Jerusalem um, as, uh, as more and more persecution was coming. And so within years, this flagship presence developed in Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas were sent from that church as missionaries to preach the gospel to different cities around the Roman Empire. And so what we, what we see is that Paul eventually finds himself in prison, all right? And so again, more pressure uh, with the, the religious community uh, started to come on him and it began to get so loud that it got the attention of the Romans. And so Paul has an option here, that he can be tried by the Jewish religious council or he can be tried as a Roman citizen. And he knows that the Jewish council, they wanna kill him they have determined they are going to take him out. And so he decides that he wants to be tried as a Roman citizen. Only problem with that is to do that, you have to stand before very powerful men and it takes some time. He was gonna to have to stand before uh, Festus and Agrippa and those boys. And so it takes some, some time. And so he's in prison for years. And we ought to thank God for that because while he's in prison and he's sitting on his hands, you know what he's doing? He's writing letters to the church of Ephesus. 
he's writing uh, letters to the Philippians and to the Colossians and to Philemon. And these are all letters that we benefit from today. Amen. And so by the end of the book of Acts, chapter 22 through 28, um, if you want to put a theme to the end of the book of Acts, you could call that the sufferings of Paul. And the reason why is because he is going through so much drama uh, that there's so much uh, things that's happening, crisis to crisis on the way to appeal and testify to the emperor. And by the end of the book, if you look at Acts 28, the very end, it's, it's a beautiful thing what it says. It says that Paul was in Rome proclaiming the kingdom of God and, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ completely unhindered. Now, in the movie Gladiator, there's this moment where Maximus wins a, a fight and, uh, and the sister of, of, um, of the emperor, Commodus, she says this. She says, today I saw a slave become more powerful than the emperor of Rome. And I believe that at this point in Paul's life, at, at Acts 28, people were saying the same thing about him. They were. See, in this journey with Jesus, as you give your life to him, as you begin to walk with him, you and I, we become a child of God positionally. All right. And Jesus bought that for you. There's nothing you can do to earn that. All right. Jesus did that for you. But over time, you and I become children of God experientially as we are led by the Spirit. But being led by definition means that we're not in control. Right. We're not in control. Sometimes God will leave you into uncomfortable and, dare I say, undesirable situations. He leads us in places that we wouldn't necessarily want to be. He leads us uh, in, in these places. And you see God do this to his own son, right? Right after he's baptized, what happens? He's driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, right? And we're also going to see that this is happening to Paul as well. And so what I want to do, what I want to submit to you is that as a believer, your surrendered and obedient life will put you in four situations. Everyone say four situations. Everyone say four situations. There you go. There. You were here. That's good. We get put in four situations that are meant to produce Christ likeness in you. And we tend to run from these four things. We we are often bothered by these four things, but these four things are a necessity for anyone who's going to live a spirit-led life. Now, I was talking to uh, one of my daughters a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Michaela, and she said to me, she said, hey, dad, you know how when you preach, you usually give us a little mini table of contents? I was like, oh, yeah, I do. And she goes, well, I like that because that way we know how long we're committed to listening to you. <laughs> so here you are. There's very little room for pride when your kids become teenagers. So if you're a child of God, you will be led into storms, shipwrecks, snake bites, and service. Okay? Storms, shipwrecks, snake bites, and service. And so what I want to do is I'm going to show you what this looks like as we just follow Paul in Acts 27 and 28. It's a fascinating story. So let me just pray. Father, I just thank you for the people of God. Hmm. I thank you, Lord, that you said in your word that anyone who comes to you must believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And so we just pray today, God, for diligent hearts. Well, we understand that to work means that you're doing it and we know that discipline means that you're doing it every day. But diligence means that we're doing it well every day. And so, Lord, would you give us hearts that desire to seek you diligently and regularly, God? And so as we uh, just read your word and we take out of it what you have for us, God, would you just uh, would you do something profound in our hearts, God? Draw us near to you in this time as we endeavor to be closer to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 So Paul, along with many other prisoners, guards, and sailors, 
is traveling by ship to Rome, but the weather begins to rage uh, and it begins to make it difficult for them to get there because it's so close to the fall. All right. And so in uh, verse 10 of Acts 27, Paul says this. He says, men, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. Verse 13, when a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it, so they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly in a wind of typhoon strength called the Northeaster, burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, and so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Cauda, where with great difficulty, we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors behind, uh, excuse me, uh, they bound ropes around the whole of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Syrtis off the African coast. So they, were lowered, they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. Now these men, they are caught up in a storm. They are trying to keep the ship from breaking up. They are throwing cargo overboard, right? They can't see the sun in the stars, which basically means they don't know now which direction is which, and they're losing hope, is what it says. Now in scripture, storms usually symbolize forces that are stronger than us, all right? Storms are reminders of how small and powerless we are. Spiritually speaking, storms usually represent suffering. Everyone say suffering. suffering. We all face storms. Amen. We all face storms. And if you've lived for a while now, you know that there are times and seasons where forces in your life, forces that are stronger than you, remind you just how small you are. Amen. We all must endure seasons of suffering, right? Maybe it's loss of a loved one. Uh, maybe it's a debilitating health issue. Uh, maybe it's a relational betrayal. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a financial or career reversal, right? We all suffer through these things. And what's important to realize as we look at this passage in this text is that the reason why Paul is in this situation is because the spirit of God led him here. Do you understand that? Paul had to go through this storm to get to where God was taking him. And here's the thing that, that, that we have to understand when we think practically about storms in our lives, okay? Just think about, just think about being in the middle of the sea and everything's raging around, all right? And so if you're in a storm practically and you're getting tossed all over the place and there's confusion and there's uh, uncertainty, you're throwing cargo overboard and there's chaos, if you can just hold on to the rudder, if you can just hang on, if you, can, if you can just keep yourself from falling off, you're, toss, you're getting tossed all over the place, but if you can just hold on, you will be further along than you were before. Do you understand that? You will get to your destination quicker if you can hold on. You, you would get there faster than if there was no cloud in the sky and it was a calm sea. Somehow, storms are accelerators for us. They're accelerators, right? If you survive a storm, you're actually better off. And so one of the first questions we ask when we get into storms and, and sufferings is why, right? Why is this happening? Which is an understandable question. We ask why. And what I can say to you is that some storms happen because of our sin, amen? Some storms happen. You sin and a storm comes into your life. How many have experienced that? You've done something? Yes, a few of us honest people in here. 
right? You do something you know you shouldn't do, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation you're like, well, man, if it ain't the consequences of my sin. So some storms come upon you because of you, but some storms come into your life because the Spirit of God is leading you into that place. And in every storm, and I would say God is so gracious that even when we're in storms because of our sin, God shows up, right? Because in every storm that you're led into, there's a general and a specific reason and purpose for it, all right? Now listen to me on this. The general purpose is for your good, and the specific purpose is godliness. Let me give you two verses. You guys don't look convinced. Now, before I give you the first one, there's a story that comes with it. Joseph, in the book of Genesis, is the favorite of all of Jacob's children. So much so that it, it shows up in his parenting and all of his brothers despise him. They hate his guts. And so one day they're in a remote area and Joseph is sent. He doesn't even do the same work his brothers do. Joseph is sent to check up on them. And as he gets to this remote area, Intending to kill him, they throw him into a pit and they eventually sell him off to slave traders that are headed to Egypt. And there in Egypt, Joseph works really hard, but it doesn't matter because someone falsely accuses him and he's thrown into prison. And so by the, by the middle of Joseph's story, he had one bad thing after another happening to him. He's praying, he's calling out from the cistern, he's calling out from the pit, right? He's calling out from the prison and God just doesn't seem to hear him. God doesn't seem to be near him at all. One storm after another, right? He can't see the sun. He can't see the stars. He doesn't know what direction is which. But if you know the story, you know that it's only because he was sold into slavery. It's only because he was thrown into prison that he meets the people that he meets and he does the things that he does that causes him to ascend to the throne. To the second, the only one he's subordinate to is Pharaoh. And because all that happens, he's able to save the people of Egypt from starvation. He's able to save his own family from starvation. And if all the bad things didn't happen, none of the good things would have happened in Joseph's life. And at the very end of the story, Joseph looks at his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And he says, you meant it for evil but God meant it for good. Now that is the Old Testament equivalent of the verse that Brandon quoted this morning. We didn't sync this up. All right, but Romans 8, 28, it, it's the, the equivalent of what Paul says in Romans 8, 28, when he says, all things work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now think about what these verses are saying for a second. Think about what these verses are saying. It does not say that everything is good. It doesn't say there's a silver lining in every cloud. It doesn't say that if you just look at all the terrible things that are happening in your life and you just look at it from a different perspective. No, it's not saying that. It's saying from the vantage point of heaven and eternity, we will be able to see that God has very carefully worked out everything in history even the things of evil intent to accomplish the opposite of what the evil intended to accomplish. That's what it's saying there. God is working all things together so that even the worst things that ever happen end up accomplishing something very good. You meant it for evil, but God is going to cause what was meant for evil to flip completely on his head and accomplish the very opposite of what it was originally intended to accomplish. And that is God's purpose in all storms. And so if you're in a storm today, the reason you're in the storm is good. And at the very least, at the very least, when storms and suffering comes into your life, it is at least an opportunity for you to grow in godliness. It's at least that. Amen? So first, Paul was led into a storm. We are led into storms. Second, I want you guys to see the shipwreck. All right, verse, uh, chapter 27, for, starting verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, 
You should have listened to me in the first place when we left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It is just, it will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. All right, so Paul uh, is, is just giving these guys a download. So, all right, let me give you a definition of shipwreck. So shipwrecks are when the vehicle you trusted in to get you to your destination fails. Y'all better give me better credit for that. Spiritually speaking, thank you, sister. Spiritually speaking, they refer to the losses of things we thought we were, were meant to make it with us to the place God was taking us. And so in this walk with God, there may be, may be some things in our lives that we raise up to these non-negotiable God levels, right? And they're really not as necessary as we think they are for the journey. And when that thing fails us, again, maybe it's a shattered dream or aspiration. Maybe it's uh, the end of a relationship or loss of an opportunity, whatever it is. Because we have this elevated thing in our hearts, we feel like the ship is going down and we're about to lose our lives. But Paul shows us something here. And I, man, this is so good. Paul shows us something here because in the midst of all the chaos, Paul stands up and he says, hey, guys, hey, guys, hey, guys, I know things are crazy. Let me just tell you something. The ship is going down. <laughs> the ship is going down. All right. The ship is going down, but we're going to be all right. You know why I know that? Because an angel of the God to whom I belong to and who I serve came and stood beside me last night. You guys know this is Paul's third shipwreck. Just imagine being on a ship and seeing it break up and just being like, oh, well, here it comes. See, Paul was practicing the presence of God in the midst of his deconstruction. Amen. See, one of the spiritual disciplines that we have to learn in this spirit led life is that when bad things happen, it is not abandonment. When bad things happen, it's not abandonment. And let me, can can I just give you one more thing? And this is for free. (laughs) If you only believe in God when he's bringing great things into your life, then you're not serving God. You're using him. Now listen, I know I'm on your heels like a pair of sweaty church socks. I know I am. (laughs) But listen, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. Too many of us believers are walking around with our heads down defeated because you have a bad day. We have the spirit of God. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead living in us. And so if you have to suffer a little bit, so what? Storms and shipwrecks may rattle you. It's okay. They may rattle you, but their purpose is to help you reaffirm your commitment to Jesus. Don't throw it overboard. Reaffirms. Look at this. There's more. Oh, there's more. Then the sailors, oh gosh, I love this. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put the anchors out in front of the ship. These guys are shady, right? So they're acting like, oh, we're fixing things, guys. And they're really trying to get off the boat. But Paul sees what's happening. He said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless these guys stay on board. And so the soldiers cut the ropes in the lifeboat and let it drift away. Verse 33, just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. 
You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Okay, so Paul tells them, hey, this ship is going down, but you're all going to live. Think about how bold that is. This, we're, this boat is not staying, but you will. But then he sees some sailors trying to get off the boat and he says, hey, you better not leave. In other words, God will save us, but you better not try to save yourself. See, one of the paradoxes of shipwrecks, one of the paradoxes of shipwrecks is that God is completely in control, uh, in control but yet what we do matters. You understand that? What we do matters. We talk a lot about all the things that God can do, and he can, right? We know that God can heal, and we know about the signs and wonders and, and miracles and revival. We know all that stuff. But what I think we don't talk about enough as believers is personal holiness and our own responsibility and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is 100% in control. But you know what else? We are all 100% responsible for how we handle suffering and storms. I already said it. And then Paul says to them, he says, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Not a hair of your heads will perish. Now, that's an interesting line because we know that Jesus has said this before, right? Now, don't forget this, that Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, he's on the boat, okay? He's on the ship, right? And so I, and, and what I love about this is you see that he's on it because all throughout the story, he's saying, we, 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 like he's talking about, and he's not French, okay? He, he's, that was a dad joke. I just caught myself. That, that, that was a dad joke. Holy smokes, I'm getting old right in front of you guys. <laughs> Michaela's been trying to call me 40 for years, and some of that just came out. So, <laughs> Luke is on this boat, and I have to believe that as he hears Paul say this, he thinks back to the gospel he wrote. Because in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is with his disciples, and they're talking about the future. And he says to them, listen to what he says to them, some of you will die but not a hair on your head will perish. Now, we need a whole sermon on that. Some of you will die, but not a hair on your head will perish. So again, this theme of suffering is here. This theme of suffering. He says, you're gonna suffer, but you're not gonna lose anything. But then he says this, and if you've heard nothing from me, this is it. He said, yet through patient endurance, you will possess your souls. Through patient endurance, you will possess your souls. And what that means is that in the end, unless and until you and I experience storms and shipwrecks, suffering and loss, you don't possess your soul. Because through suffering and loss, a mature spirit-led believer learns that I don't need everything I just need God. Why? Because if I have God, I have everything. And so Paul was led into a storm, into a shipwreck. Third, a snake bite. Acts 28, starting in verse 1. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. Malta means refuge. One of the definitions. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, but they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. And as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook it off shook the snake off into the fire and was unharmed. People waited for him to swell up or to suddenly drop dead, 
But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided that he was a god. <laughs> okay? Now, let me set this up for you. When all 276 of these men went from the ship that broke down, shipwreck, and they got to this island, right? I'm just thinking if I'm Paul, I mean, Paul could have absolutely gone Maximus here. Are you not entertained? <laughs> this brother said, the ship is going down. No one's going to die. And then it happens. And now they're all walking up on the island. And I'm just thinking that, man, Paul in this moment, he could be making a fuss about himself. He can be exalting himself. He could even be starting to use this as leverage to get himself out of imprisonment. But do you know the first thing he does? The first thing he does is he serves. He goes and he gathers sticks to help make a fire. See, this is what a real Christian looks like. All right. The, the way you know that you're in the presence of a real Christian is that real Christians are having their self-importance destroyed bit by bit by the presence and the spirit of God. Paul, think about this. Paul was a man who was captive, but through miracle was set free, yet through service still acted like a servant. That's a Christian. That's what a Christian looks like. And so Paul is laying sticks in the fire and a poisonous snake jumps out of the fire. And I, I love the, the language of the King James Version because it says it fastened itself on Paul's hand. You know, as a believer, not only are we led into storms and into shipwrecks, suffering and loss, but you and I will be led to enemies who intend to attack us. All right. Now, you've heard me say this before because I think it's, it's very true. Um, and I think it's multifaceted. Christianity is a contact sport. Now, there's a healing element to that, but there's also a warring element to that. Christianity is a fight. Uh, J.C. Ryle uh, was a 19th century uh, Anglican bishop. He said this. He said, there are thousands. This, this quote is fire. There are thousands of men and women who go to church and chapels every Sunday. They call themselves Christians, but it's not real, genuine Christianity. It satisfies sleepy consciences, but it's not good money. Why? You never see any fight in their religion. A spiritual strife of exertion, of conflict with sin, of self-denial, of watching and warring, they know little at all. And so a true, listen to this last part, a true Christian is known for inner warfare as for new inner peace. I mean, let me, let me make, let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here, okay? There's places in your life where there was pain, but now that you're a Christian, there's peace. But I want to also tell you that there are places in your life where there was peace, but now that you're a Christian, there's pain. All right. In other words, when you become a Christian, you get new comforts, but you know what you also get? You get new enemies. You get new enemies. Christianity is a fight. So don't be surprised when you get attacked. Don't be surprised. If you've been an athlete at all in your life, you understand this. Right? If, if you are trained to be a prize fighter, if you are, are, are training for you know, a UFC fight, you know that the only way for you to have a chance in that fight is if you regularly allow someone to punch you in the mouth in efforts to get ready for this thing. This is how that works. You have to constantly be in situations where you're being attacked so that it strengthens you for the real thing. And so walking with God will comfort you in places where you were once disturbed but it will also disturb you in places where you were once comfortable. That's what this is. All right, so Paul was doing a good thing. He was serving when he was attacked, but then the Bible says that he shook the creature off into the fire and he suffered no harm. Now, at first, the locals saw this and they thought he was an evil man, right? They just knew it. They thought he was, he was evil, but after seeing Paul's response, they thought he was a god. Now, what can we learn from this? This is what I think we can learn. What I think is that uh, we all will always have snakes in our lives. <laughs> right? 
we'll always have snakes in our lives. Because we live in a fallen world and as a child of God, we have to contend with our flesh and the devil. You and I are prone to attack. But if you truly understand who you are, and if you truly understand where God's taking you, and if you truly understand what you're here for, the attacks don't have to harm you. Do you understand what I'm saying? You will be attacked, but they don't have to harm you. And it's not just about you, because when you respond well to crisis, when you get attacked and shake it off, because it's so foreign to the people who are watching you, it's so foreign to what, what they're normally accustomed to see people do under attack, they will see God in you. And so here's a thought for you. It's like, you, you want to overthrow your coworkers' theology? You want to you wanna mess with your neighbor's silly superstitions? Go ahead and suffer well and see what happens. They will be all up in your grill asking you about the hope that lies within you. Now, listen, you can't just have this knee-jerk, quick reaction to suffering. Some of us are really good at that. Something happens, I'm okay, I'm okay. Like, we're, like we, in a moment, we do well, but over time, we struggle. And it says they watched Paul. And over time, they realized, man, I see God. Same thing for us. Same thing for us. And so... Paul was in a storm. He was in a shipwreck. He was in a snake bite. Lastly, and I'll make this quick. Service. Acts 28, starting in verse 7, says, Near the shore where he landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. And as it happened, Publius's father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were showered with honors, and when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. Okay, so again, Paul meets the chief official. He finds out his father is ill. He heals his father. The sick people of the island find out, and they come, and he heals them too. Now, it's easy for us to look at this passage here to see what's going on with Paul here, and to conclude that, man, he's, he's doing a great job serving these people. But what I would submit to you guys and what we need to see is that Paul has been serving this whole time. Paul was serving in the storm. Paul was serving in the shipwreck. Paul was serving in the snake bite, and he was serving at the estate. And so what do we gather from that? What we gather is that serving isn't something Paul did. It's who Paul was. Does that describe you? Just ask yourself that. Does that describe you? Because the way that you'll know that you're living a life that's led by the Spirit is that serving others is as natural to you as breathing and is as instinctive and involuntary as your heartbeat. When you suffer, when you're experiencing loss, when you're being attacked, if you can just take the focus off yourself for just a minute and lift your head up, you will see that there are so many opportunities to serve. And let me just tell you, there's no better moment to serve than when people know you're under duress and you're thinking about them. Jesus, when he was on the cross, suffering on the cross, Jesus said, what? Father, forgive them. You never look more like Jesus than when you're suffering and you serve. I have some friends, um, Ashley Burgerhouse and, and Caitlin Boyd, uh, they're, they're starting this new women's group in the next few weeks called Breaking Free. You guys saw the flyer earlier today. And the focus is to help women who have lost hope or who are stuck in pain due to physical, emotional, 
or spiritual abuse. And as I sat down with them and just spent time talking about this and the idea and how the course would work and all that stuff, they talked about how some of their own experiences and some of their own hard-won victories have led them to a place where now they desire to serve others. And they want to create a space for women to be able to talk about this and process this and get educated and empowered. Okay, that's what this looks like. All right, a spirit-led life is a life of service. Another thing I want to make you guys aware of is in the month of July, we're going to lean into this idea of service. We're going to do it more in our messages. Uh, Starting next week, we're going to begin a new series uh, on uh, biblical hospitality. Right? And, and, and hospitality, uh, just to define it, is about extending the welcome of God to others. That's what it is. Right? It's this bridge that connects our, our theology to our daily life and concerns. It's, it's literally what makes the believer believable. All right? Biblical hospitality is what allows us to make the greatest commandment and the great commission our greatest concern. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, um, when talking about service and hospitality, he said this, he said, every believer is either a missionary or an imposter. (laughs) So we're going to lean into this. We're going to talk about this more. We're going to to spend some time on this so we can be a people who don't just serve because it's something we do. It's who we are. Amen. And so will you stand with me? So let me ask the question for you. Where do we get the power to do this? Huh? Where where do we get the power, right? How can we be a people who suffer well, who deal with loss, who endure attack, all with a heart of service? How, How do we do that? Let me tell you how we do this. We do it by resting in and relying on Jesus who died on the cross in service to us. That's how we do this. See, Jesus is the greater Paul because Jesus suffered well and Jesus dealt with loss and Jesus endured attack for us. Uh, Jesus is the ultimate Joseph, whose brothers abandoned him and who was falsely accused and who was forgotten, but eventually would ascend to the throne and become the source of salvation for his people. Jesus is the ultimate Jonah who found himself on a ship in a storm and the ship was about to break off up, it was about to break up. And for the benefit of everyone on board, he was thrown overboard. Jesus took the storm of God's wrath for you. Jesus took on the bite of the enemy. He took the bite. Genesis chapter three says that he would bruise his heel, but eventually he would crush his head. John chapter three, Jesus himself says this. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the son of man be lifted up. And he's referring to Numbers 21. And in Numbers 21, they're grumbling in the wilderness and poisonous snakes come out and they start biting people and killing people. And the remedy for healing, God says, Moses, go and create a bronze serpent and attach it to a pole and lift that thing up. And if they just believe enough to look at it, Those who are sick and ill and dying, I will save them. I will save them. And so just as that snake was hung on a pole, Jesus was hung on a pole for you. And if you see him hanging there and you believe that he can save you and heal you, he absolutely will. Jesus is the ultimate Maximus Decimus Meridius. Help me out here. He is the greatest of all gladiators who didn't just die for a nation. He died for the whole world. And if 
you do not know him as your God and Savior, the first step to being spirit led is responding to him right here, right now. And so with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, Is there anyone here today who would say, Sean, I don't know Jesus, but I want to. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Amen, sister, I see you. Raise your hand. See, the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. All right. don't, don't think that the tug of your heart right here, right now, is always going to be there. Because if you say no today, your heart just may harden and it very well may be harder to say yes and easier to say no next time. So raise your hand. This is my last call. If you're here today and you know that you need Jesus, slip your hand up. We don't want to embarrass you. We just want to help you and pray for you. Amen. Amen. Secondly, if you're here and you would say, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a believer but I don't feel like I'm living the spirit-led life like I should. I don't have that like I want. If you hear you would say that, just raise your hand. We wanna pray for you as well. Amen, amen, all across the room, amen, amen. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that though we are led into storms, and suffering, that we're led into shipwrecks and loss, that we're led into snake bites and attack. And though we are burdened with this idea of service, that you are not asking us to do anything that your son has not done in an ultimate sense. And so empower us right now by the Holy Ghost, by your spirit, begin to work in our lives, begin to work in our hearts. Help us to sense and know your presence. Lord, I thank you. Lord, your word says in Isaiah 40, it says that we are your reward, (laughs) that you reward those who diligently seek you. But Isaiah says, we are your reward, that you, Jesus, took the major L on the cross. Lord, you suffered, you experienced loss, you experienced attack. And you did all that so that you could bring us home. You're infinitely better and greater than anything in our lives. Lord, everything else is peripheral. Everything else is. And so if the only thing today that's in the way of me fully knowing you and experiencing you and walking with you is my own stubborn will, by your spirit, Help me. God, we thank you that you are so good that nothing that is coming ahead can threaten, God, what belongs to you. Yet through patient endurance, (laughs) yet through patient endurance, as spirit-led believers, we will possess our souls. And I thank you for that promise in Jesus' name.